knows what the world would have looked like without the Silk Road. It's typically associated with China and neighboring countries, but over its centuries of existence, the Silk Road connected Asian nations with the Arabian Peninsula, Southern Europe, and Northern Africa, including maritime routes to reach even further. The Silk Road, of course, allowed for the trade of silk, but all sorts of goods were trafficked along this route. Things like paper, gunpowder, spices, Buddhism, Christianity, and the plague. And of course, the real reason why we are here today, precious gemstones. Let's take a walk down the Silk Road, if you will, and learn about some of the gems that traveled this road and helped shape the cultures of the world. The earliest precursors of the Silk Road began with the Chinese rubbing elbows with India, the Persian Empire, and Alexander the Great's Macedonian Empire. Things really took off around 30 BC when the Roman Empire entered the chat by conquering Egypt. Suddenly, trade and communication between these regions was at unprecedented levels, and what we now call the Silk Road really hit its stride. Chinese silks could be seen in the streets of Rome, and Roman colored glass decorated the tables of the Chinese elite. But it wasn't just goods that traveled the road, but people as well. It's nice to have new and exotic foreign gem rough, but what good is it if no one in town has the skills to cut it and make it truly special? The Silk Road not only allowed for the trade of gems and minerals, but also facilitated the spread of the gem cutting industry as a whole. Wherever the gems went, the lapidaries went too and brought their craft with them. Jade, ruby, sapphire, emerald, and pearls were all frequent travelers of the Silk Road. But I wanna talk about one that may surprise you, asbestos. What exactly is it? Asbestos refers to six naturally occurring silicate minerals, and they all have long, thin, fibrous crystals. And as you can see, it isn't exactly prettier than the other gems we'll see on the Silk Road. So what's it being traded for? Well, asbestos is remarkably heat resistant. Its long, thin crystal structure also makes it relatively easy to integrate into fabrics. The Chinese people called it cloth that can be cleansed by fire. In Rome, Pliny the Elder's writing gives an account of asbestos fabric being used to wrap the bodies of the elite who were being cremated. This would ensure separation of the human ashes from the rest of the pile, and the fabric would come out just fine. Ew. Ancient Iranian scholars claim that Neo-Persian King Khosro the Victorious had an asbestos fabric napkin. To clean it after a meal, he just tossed it in the fire. Pretty cool party trick, but as we know by now, inhaling asbestos fibers is very bad for you, potentially causing asbestosis and even cancer. So maybe a napkin you put to your mouth every meal isn't such a great idea after all. Moving on to the more colorful stones, let's talk about what was referred to as the carbunculus. Pliny the Elder writes that it was so called for its resemblance to fire. By the way, I wanna give my man Pliny a shout out just for writing everything down and taking incredible notes. He's a long time friend of the channel and we'll be mentioning him a few more times in this video. Anyway, the flaming carbunculus. There were a handful of varieties of carbunculus going around at the time, but the most valuable one in the eyes of the Romans was one called Astrian. Pliny describes it as closely resembling crystal in its nature and writes that in the center of it, there shines internally a brilliant star with refulgence like that of the moon when full. That sounds to me like he's talking about star ruby. They are full of thin, needle-like inclusions of a mineral called rutile that caused this striking phenomenon. Many of these carbuncles came from India and Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was so renowned for its gemstones that the Chinese people referred to it as Jewel Isle. In fact, travelers from the 6th century all the way up to Marco Polo provided accounts of a magnificent ruby kept in a Buddhist temple. Some describe it as big as a pine cone, as thick as a man's arm, fiery with sunlight, and of utterly incalculable value. I wonder if they're all talking about the same one. Next, let's talk about glass and rock crystal. Though they look the same, one is man-made, whereas the other one is naturally occurring quartz. The Chinese regarded rock crystal as an exotic luxury and believed it was petrified ice. Pretty cool. In Rome, meanwhile, high quality glass was the real luxury. While historians aren't sure the exact origins of glass, Pliny credits Phoenician sailors with first introducing it to the Romans. Glass, as well as the art of making it, was spread all along the Silk Road, eventually reaching India, where, according to Pliny, the craft was perfected. 
He said their glass was superior due to their usage of crushed up crystal, making it second to none. In China, one of those far west luxuries was the color glass of Rome. Chinese writers noted 10 different varieties of glass there, from black to fiery red and every color in between. If you really want to talk about ancient luxury though, you have to talk about pearls. Culturing methods were many centuries away at this time, and the only way to get a pearl was to grab yourself a snorkel and get in there. Many ancient pearls came from Sri Lanka, where elephants were often ridden into the sea in search of those little round beauties. Once out of the water, they made their way all up and down the Silk Road, and almost always into the hands of royalty and the upper elite, where they were featured in clothes and jewelry. One famous example is the wife of Roman Emperor Caius, who Pliny claims to have once seen completely covered in emeralds and pearls, which in total amounted to over 40 million sesterces. As impressive as that is, wait until you hear about one of the biggest power moves in human history. To impress Mark Antony, Egyptian Queen Cleopatra had two pearls brought to her and plopped them into two cups of vinegar, watching them slowly dissolve. As if that wasn't enough, the two lovers knocked back the two most expensive shots of all time, and then chased them with liquid gold, probably. I'm kidding about the last part, of course, but the value of the pearl in ancient Rome cannot be understated. They were regarded as the single most precious thing in the entire world, more so than diamonds, emeralds, the starriest star ruby, or the finest gold. Their natural beauty, without any need for human intervention, like cutting or polishing, made them one of a kind. What gems would you wear as an emperor? Let us know down in the comments below, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching.